Hello, my name's Andy. Welcome to episode 40 of Keeping Water. In this week's episode, I'm going to be looking at my tench and the mild deformities two of them have and what the possible cause might be. I'll also give a little update on my new fish, the Crucians, how they're settling in and how their health is. And finally, I'll take a look at some of the tinkering I've got done around the pond, some of which was simple and worked, and some very much wasn't and, well, didn't. If you watch a lot of YouTube, you'll know that creators will often ask you to subscribe to their channel, and I'm no exception to that. However, I'll also let you into the secret power behind clicking the subscribe button. For instance, last week I shared the tricks your fish will perform for you, and this week, if you click the subscribe button, elves will clean your filters while you sleep. Right, let's get started. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that I have four species, carp, rudd, tench, and now crucian carp. I have three tench, one considerably bigger and older at just over 18 inches, and a potential breeding pair of around 12 inches. Aside from potential fin rot, which one had and appears now to have recovered from, they appear healthy, and without anthropomorphizing too much, they appear happy with their life in the pond. However, as you may have noticed, there's something a little unique about two of the tench, and I'm going to discuss this a little in this segment. First, the largest tench. As it's grown bigger, it's developed a pronounced hump, so instead of a smooth transition between head and then back and dorsal fin, it has a sharp rise. I was fairly confident that this wasn't normal growth and development, so in the best traditions of research, I turned to Google. I did a quick image search, and although there were some where the back raised up more than the usual smooth transition, none were like my tench. I realise that's not entirely scientific, but it at least gives a base to work from, and I do do some better research later. The next tench, the male tench, has a subtler but still obvious deformity. Best seen viewed from the front, it shows that its head is slightly askew to the left. I've obviously noticed it for quite a while, although not previously mentioned it, and so far at least it does not appear to have caused them any problems. But I was interested to work out what might have caused it, especially as two of the three tench I have are both experiencing some amount of deformity. So, I turned to Google, but this time tried to find some relevant and proper research. A number actually came up specifically about tench and skeletal deformity. As is often the case though, you don't always get access to full articles without paying, which is okay and I understand, but it's a little frustrating at times. Anyway, I found a couple of interesting ones, especially two from Poland, which looked at a lot of different factors affecting growth, including temperature, diet, environment, etc. They took a large sample size from intensively grown fish, which while obviously different from a small pond environment, did give a lot of useful data to learn from. The study I could read the full text from yielded some interesting facts. It looked at two possible hypotheses. One, temperature can significantly influence body chemical composition and the incidence of body deformities in fish. And two, the effects of temperature on fish depends on their diet. The fish studied were juvenile tench and were split into two groups. One fed natural food and the other fed dry pellets. Each group was then in turn separated into further groups and kept at 10 degrees, 23 degrees and 26 degrees. The findings were as follows. Body deformities occurred in all groups of fish fed solely or partially with a dry diet, 21.5% to 
The incidence of deformities was directly proportional to the temperature and the content of dry feed in the diet reaching the maximum in fish fed exclusively the dry diet at 26 degrees. The conclusions they drew therefore were that deformities in tench were considerably higher in fish that were fed a dry pellet diet than those fed a more natural one and that this in turn it was exacerbated by the fish living in higher temperatures. They also determined that an insufficiency of phosphorus in the dry diet played a major part in the incidence of deformities. Now, this is all pretty new to me, but mostly makes sense. It also has relevance to my tench. Their diet is predominantly pellets, as they eat the same food that I feed the carp. As you may know, I also regularly give bloodworms, but my guess is that the bigger carp and the faster rud get the majority of these. So, does this explain my fish's mild deformities? Genetics may also play a part, as I'm not sure their genetic stock was that high. But with an identified connection between diet and deformities, and my fish having the type of diet with which deformities are more likely, it seems a reasonable conclusion to draw. Where that leaves me is less clear. Will the deformities worsen? If so, can I negate this by feeding either a more natural diet or one with higher phosphorus content? I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this and your experiences of this with tench or other fish. The Crucians have settled in really well. They appear very confident with the other fish, although predominantly show off the rud or, when more sedentary, by themselves hanging out by the pipework. They've been looking for food keenly, or they were often beaten to it by the tench and carp. However, they've also been eating the algae. Their abrasions and torn fins appear no worse, if not a little better, and there are no signs of any subsequent infections. I still need to keep a close eye on them, obviously, and the other fish over the coming weeks. As much as you can apply human emotions to fish, which really isn't that much, they certainly do appear happy in their new home, and I'm feeling optimistic. I've done a few jobs around the pond lately. Some are small little tweaks, some larger, some have been successful, some not so much. Anyway, job one. Since adding the gravel liner as a test, I've noticed the water level has been dropping, just an inch and then stopping, but dropping nevertheless. I worked out why pretty quickly. A couple of years ago, I was cutting the marginal plants back and like the clumsy bloke I am, I cut the liner on a fold which is a nightmare place to fix and patch. I used some liner tape in the end, which worked. However, when placing the gravel liner, I probably damaged this fix. I therefore removed the old tape and replaced it. All was fixed and the pond holds water again. Job number two. As you may know from my moving bed build videos, I had a couple of leaks after rebuilding the filter pipe work. One appeared to seal itself and one did and then, well, started up again. Anyway, I've got a new gate valve and replaced the whole section. Again, a successful fix. And as you can see, the small piece of pipe connecting the old valve had split, which pretty much explains the leak. Job three, another task born from some previous tweaking of mine. In a recent episode, I showed how I'd increased the flow into the filters. I needed to keep an eye on this as previously the flow in was greater than the flow out could be, meaning the multiplay level would gradually rise to the point of overflowing. Another factor affecting this was that I also replaced, off camera as it were, the clip holding the pipe onto the pump in the pond. This may have also increased the flow, as the seal was far better afterwards. Anyway, 
Over time, the level of the multiplayer continued to rise, slowly, about a millimetre or two a week, but it was definitely rising. I therefore once again used my high-tech DIY splitter adjustment tool to open some flow into the pond, reducing the flow into the filter. Although this has worked, it is a shame, as I really wanted to take the splitter out. Looks like I'm stuck with it for now, at least until I can get a very flow pump. Job 4. Another job outstanding from the moving bed build was improving the aeration to get more of the media actually moving. My suspicion is that my air pump at 30 litres is underpowered, but as a new pump is not possible at the moment, I've tried to think of ways to get the most out of it and cover as much of the moving bed as possible. So I thought of making a grid or diffuser out of PVC pipe to provide air across the length and width of the moving bed. I cobbled together a first go at it, however the holes were too big and air only came out of the first 8 inch or so of the pipework. I then tried to think of ways to cover the holes to reduce the number and size of them. Anyway, whilst considering this, I decided instead to use some garden hose and make holes with a needle. Again, this was my first go at this, and well, it worked much better, but still produced insufficient air to actually move the media. I tried adding more holes, which helped a little at first, but this was somewhat a case of diminishing returns as adding too many eventually meant that air stopped flowing around the whole of the hose pipe. So, back to square one and the air disc. My next idea is to add another air disc, as although splitting the output from the pump won't help, splitting it between two discs will hopefully move media across a greater area. We'll see. Job 5. The output from the filter through the orange drain pipe is through making an increasingly frequent and an increasingly loud gurgling noise. To fix it, I've reduced the flow to it through the splitter, which was a surprisingly easy fix, with the added benefit that the increased flow through the below water outlet meant that some settled detritus was moved around the pond a bit, heading, hopefully, towards the pump. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Keeping Water. I really do appreciate it. In next week's episode, I'll show some more tinkering, including a significant change to the media in the multibay. I'll also show how the fish have been feeding increasingly enthusiastically and talk a little of my plans for the coming summer. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.